inizia. Buongiorno, buonasera, ormai. Good evening, good evening everyone. We are very happy to meet Marco Bussetti, the Minister of Education. It is not the first time that uh, public education ministers uh, come to the meeting. Most of them came to the meeting over the years. To all of them, we asked the questions that are most important for us, those questions that acknowledge the importance of school and education for the history of our country. But it is the first time for me, a simple teacher of uh, philosophy and history of uh, uh, the scientific Lyceum of uh, Milan to present him. By the way, my school at the moment has no principal. Why am I here to introduce the minister? Well, because I had the pleasure to meet him before he became uh, a minister when he was uh, the uh, superintendent of schools in Milan. And uh, while well, meeting him was really something that had an impact of, on me because of his uh, knowledge, because of his humanity, and because uh, he was really moved by the realities, by the situations he met. As for instance, Porto Franco. <clears throat> I had uh, the pleasure to start the work at Porto Franco thanks to the genius of uh, Father Giorgio Pontigia. And here, really, it's the time for a round of applause. Porto Franco, as you know, is a center for young people, where young people can find help to do their homeworks, to study for free. So there are volunteers, grown-ups, students, students of many different ages. So we have Porto Franco in Milan, but also another 40 cities in Italy. Yesterday, the minister came at the a conference with the res those responsible for the different Porto Franco centers. Over the past 18 years, many authorities paid homage to Porto Franco, and um, well, most of them were really impressed by this place that was uh, defined by the singer uh, Enzo Iannacci in 2011, a place full of young people, light, and mystery. So as I said, I met many different uh, ministers, but uh, Marco Bussetti was one of uh, the visitors who was most interesting in the nature of Porto Franco. And I would like to tell you an episode. On May the 24th of this year, probably he knew already something. No, he says he did, he did it anyway. On May the 24th this year, we celebrated the 18 years of activity of Porto Franco, and we created an award, which is called the Father Giorgio Pontigia Award, thanks to uh, some donors, as for instance, uh, Pietro Portalupi. Lupi. Well, uh, th this award is actually a prize in money that is uh, awarded to, to young people who express their needs that might also be needs that have nothing to do with school and education. So in that celebration, Marco Bussetti participated as a member of the jury. He spent the whole day with us. A very hot day it was. It was a beautiful day because of the presence of the young people there and for the humor of Giacomo Poretti. So in uh, today's uh, meeting, 
we do not want to, to make a list of everything that uh, needs to be done in terms of education in school, but would like to interact with him. So we will have a teacher, we will have a principal, we will have a student, ask him in questions. But the first question, um, it's going to be my question. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Minister Bussetti what uh, impressed the most in Porto Franco. What was decisive in terms of uh, his work as a minister and for uh, his work in the school system? Thank you. Thank you, Alberto. And good evening, everybody. Well, it is very difficult to summarize what really impressed me in Porto Franco because there were so many emotions in looking at those people who knew perfectly well what kind of problems young people have to face and young people who in a, in a way, fear these problems, which are part of everybody's life. Problems that are necessary to find new balances and to face further crises in the future. And this is something that somehow can limit the potential of these young people in terms of uh, their human richness, their skills. And so there are so many people that devote their time with love and passion, with care, uh, towards these young people asking for help. What really hit me or impressed me is that these young people overcome their crisis. They um, uh, conclude their studies, they get their uh, graduation, and then they come back to Porto Franco to give back what they have been given. So this is a, an expression of love and passion for life, for experience, and for uh, uh, in a way, the the uh, the w a way to say thank you to those grown-ups who have dedicated their times to them. So I really wanted to congratulate you for what you do. So I would now invite on stage Matteo Sama with his question. Salve, mi, mi chiamo Matteo Sama e sono... My name is Matteo Sama. I have just concluded my studies in Bologna. I have been the student representative of the institute and chairman of the Students Council for the province of Bologna. And I would like to tell you about something that happened two years ago in February during an assembly of the students, I invited Silvio Cattarina from the community called Comunità dell'Imprevisto of Pesaro that works with former drug addicts, young drug addicts. And I did that because in our school, A student had committed suicide because of his drug addiction. So, well, um, students met young people with uh, drug addiction problems. And uh, in this school, in my school, where the uh, that of drugs was a very se serious problem, well, this was really important. And uh, the day after, some guys, uh, some kids, uh, some students came to me and said thank you 
And I still remember that moment because uh, it was the first time that uh, during the break uh, there was no uh, smell of drugs in the school. The first time in five years. The vice principal was uh, present uh, at the school with whom uh, I had uh, a good uh, friendship because he was uh, uh, the first person who thanked me for this uh, meeting and I started to open up with him. When my parents told me that I could not go to the uh, class uh, uh, trip, and I had to choose, because I had to choose between uh, the school trip and uh, the spiritual exercise moment uh, of uh, uh, the uh, Catholic Association I'm part of. And I went to the vice principal and I said I wouldn't go to the uh, school trip. And he said uh, that he was going to pay for it himself. He convinced the principal and some, some uh, teachers. And th that was the beginning of a very strong friendship between myself and the vice principal. And this really changed me. And this year, now that I have graduated, I've never been uh, very um, uh, I've never studied a lot and uh, uh, but mm, thanks to the friendship uh, with the, the the vice principal we met once a week I started to I started to study more and I started to we started to study with some uh, schoolmates and this helped me uh, when I took my exam at the end of the year. And uh, when our teachers uh, asked us to find a topic that could be discussed during our exams, I thought about something, uh, uh, to write something about myself, my experience, my heart. Since the vice principal was my friend and he worked on my heart. So I made a connection with the First World War. And uh, together with the, an Alpine choir, we sang a, a song in my school. And that was really beautiful. And my um, math teacher, and it was, I've never been very good at maths, actually. And she was really moved at, at the end of the exam crying, she thanked me for the years spent together. And so with that exam, my uh, experience in uh, that school ended. But these five years changed me, changed my approach to life. So well, uh, just one teacher that looks at me as a person rather than a name on the class book. So I'm asking, how can we give a positive evaluation to those teachers that, by teaching, also engage with the hearts of our, their students? This is a very difficult question, Matteo. It's um, a very sensitive topic, that of um, evaluation. And I'd like to talk as a father when we talk about uh, the, the evaluation of uh, students. Each mark my daughter takes home, I tell her this is uh, the mark that has been given to your classwork. You are something different because you said something which is right, Matteo. Teachers and the school in general has to interact with persons, but there has to be also a general starting point. The organization, the system, forces a series of uh, different uh, figures, f people. So I th there is the teacher on the one side, there is the student on the other. But 
in order to have a class with a certain number of students and a teacher, behind there is a very, very difficult and complicated work, administrative work, that starts many months before. After the teachers, uh, after the end of the school, teachers start working to um, start the new school year in September. So I'm talking about the teachers, about principals, about all the school staff and uh, uh, all the administrative staff of schools. So if we talk about evaluations of uh, teachers, well, this is quite difficult. I didn't like what happened last year. At the end of the school year, some funds were given to principals and they had to distribute them among their uh, teachers. And uh, well, I believe that if one has to be evaluated, uh, one needs to know on what this evaluation is going to be made. So I asked for a meeting with the trade unions. It was a very good spirit of cooperation. So we have decided that from the very beginning, from September, that all teachers will know what the indicators and the objectives will be that will be evaluated at the end of the year. So the criteria for this evaluation. So it has to be said that there are also some aspects, some characteristics that should be part of the profile of a teacher linked with a certain sensitivity, attention to people, to their lives, their experience, the different uh, reasons of their behavior and attitudes so that everyone can be supported, followed, and evaluated in a very personal way. Your experience is due to uh, the presence of an external force, just like in Porto Franco, a regenerating force that gives you uh, the will to, to start again. Because I believe that uh, the sense of belonging is one of the real objectives of school, because this uh, will uh, lead to a more holistic education. This is something we often take for granted, but we need to enhance uh, the uh, skills, the uh, attitudes, rather than the knowledge. So we need to take into account uh, what are uh, the the skills, but the the, the natural skills of be of students. So this is the teaching approach that should take inspiration from Rosmini, who said that young people have no rights, they are a right, and they need to be loved. So this empathy, this affection, communication, exchange of ideas, exchange of opinions, mutual knowledge, these is the only way by which we can judge, evaluate the person rather than their classwork, classworks. Lydia. Buonasera a tutti. Mi chiamo Lydia. My name is Lydia. I'm a math teacher. This year, I started to teach in a professional technical school, and my first challenge was this change because before I used to teach in a different kind of school, and I had problems with uh, the students of the first two years uh, because uh, it was a big challenge for me. I wanted to show them the beauty of this discipline and I wanted to 
show them the link between uh, my subject and what they uh, what they will be doing as a job in the future. But I met with many problems and different needs. On the one hand, the students showed the need to be closely supported, guided, step by step. But on the other hand, I had some problems since I sometimes I lacked the means, maybe I uh, we didn't have uh, internet connections or we had uh, too many students in the class. So this made it difficult for me to devote the right amount of attention to each student. So in this situation, I felt really that I, there was nothing I could do. But this, however, doesn't mean that uh, we cannot start again through some unforeseen events. And I want to share with you uh, partic a particular story. In, my, in a, in a um, first class, 31 students, all the uh, um, boys, many strangers, foreigners, and uh, the, it was really hard to work with them from the very beginning. And sometimes with my colleagues, with we said that it was almost impossible to work with them. We were really, it was really discouraging to work with this class. And I felt a sense of a failure because I couldn't do what I wanted to do with these students. But then a new um, opportunity opened up for me. Instead of waiting for them to change, I started to think that I could find something new in my relationship to my students. And this made things change for me. I had noticed that there was a boy, one of the most difficult ones. Uh, he had failed already the first class. And um, he had realized that I cared about him. He waited for me, he waited for uh, me to look at him. And this in a way impressed me because um, there was a, some sort of desire he was trying to, to hide. So in uh, January, I finally met his parents and uh, they told me, oh, our son has a lot of problems. Um, also behavioral problems at school. We don't know what to do. We no longer know what we can do. And it was true, he had a lot of problems at school. And he could repeat the class once again. But I understood that there was more in him. Because uh, if he had, had failed, we would have lost track of him. We wouldn't know what uh, he would do. So the fact that he, start, he might start to study one of the different subjects could be a first step in this difficult path. So at a certain point, I shared this hope with them because uh, there is something good in reality, something beautiful that we have to identify. And so something unexpected happened. These parents that uh, looked so discouraged, they decided to trust me and asked their uh, son to uh, go to uh, um, afternoon lessons. And this really, well, really had an impact on me because I looked at this boy who had to start studying again. When I entered the classroom, and when I was still on the cor in the corridor, he came out with his uh, copy book and he said, uh, I did my homework, teacher. These are my homeworks. And this was uh, something new for him because normally he didn't do his homework. So this is... Uh, 
a, 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 a boy, a young man that does something new, that starts to, to have a more self-esteem. And this is an important example because uh, during this year it has been important for me to understand that in front of uh, difficulties and issues and problems, uh, you can take two different stances. That is to say to complain and brood all the time and reduce then uh, the effort and the commitment or start from what ha is happening, even if it is uh, something small, to to and encourage the student. So this challenge is something that uh, I meet in my class, but I believe this is something that can be found in any other uh, job. So starting from my experience, I have two questions for the minister. Well, uh, seen the difficulties due also to the lack of tools or somehow or uh, the high number of students in one class. I would like to ask you, Mr. Minister, what are the concrete opportunities to manage in a more adequate way existing resources or increasing the existing resources? And what are uh, the aspects that uh, should be enhanced according to your opinion? Then my second question, and then it is maybe a more technical question. Since part of my job is carried out in classes that are that are meant for professional education, I would like to know what are the changes of the new decree, the new law. If the objective is to put the two parts together, education and professional training, um, I wonder what are the characteristics uh, of a professional education in, with reference to regional training parts. So, well, uh, this is really something that is uh, closely connected to my own experience. Well, uh, once again, uh, we go back to what we were saying earlier, educational strategies, uh, teaching strategies, the skills of a teacher, uh, of all the teachers of an entire school department. Sometimes these topics are uh, tackled in a certain kind of schools Whereas in professional institutes, sometimes uh, the, some situations are, uh, well, simply accepted. Well, the uh, reaction of uh, this teacher showed that uh, through emotional uh, uh, strategies, you can actually recover the relationship to uh, a student. The problem of uh, too many students in a classroom, well, this is uh, uh, a, a serious problem. We have about 21.2 students per class, uh, whereas in some uh, specific institute, well, 31 is uh, 31 makes it uh, difficult to uh, divide the class into two classes of uh, 16 students each. but. Well, obviously, the idea is uh, to uh, stay within the limit of uh, 21, 22 students because um, there are also, well, safety problems, uh, legal problems that impose uh, uh, some specific choices. Train parts, educational parts, well, they are part of our um, system. They were created in the 50s after the Second World War. Our industries were starting again. They, uh, um, we need uh, to have a, a skilled labor force and uh, the um, school becomes functional to this need. 
So now, paradoxically, we are uh, reliving uh, some uh, moments. There is a, a potential that is ready to express itself. Taking into account uh, specific needs, uh, smart students. And here, professional institutes can have, can play a very important role because, as I said before, we first have to look at the potential of these students. And above all, it is important that schools, in this very particular moment in history, need to be at the heart of education and training with a real identity, with a sense of belonging. Professional schools are extremely important. And it is also important to find this passage. That's because we now give more attention to working activity. And there are moments when uh, there are also influences, the uh, passage from uh, regional schools to professional schools is also foreseen. But this is not the end of it, because there is also something else afterwards. Above all, we need to have uh, a link with the, the entrepreneurial world which wasn't there in the 50s and 60s with the enterprises, industries, the companies, so that young people can see a, an opportunity for their future. So the world of education and training needs to be connected with the world of uh, um, with the work and the access of the labor to the labor market. So because uh, there is the need there is the need to take into account um, um, the uh, professional profiles that are going to be needed in the entrepreneurial world Buongiorno. So good afternoon. My name is Silvio Nitella. I am a doctor and I am here as a president of a non-state school. I have a short int introduction that I would like to read out before reaching um, to the uh, questions. Uh, dear Minister, this is Friday. That's the third Friday of the month. Uh, uh, we are about to end the week, but there's a last uh, meeting, which is the board of directors of this month. Uh, we The meeting is scheduled at uh, half past uh, eight. Uh, it is a school in Modena. There are 830 students, uh, about 130 students uh, in various uh, age brackets and various types of schools, and lots of points on the agenda. We're having dinner together and we start discussing the various topics. The president, who is myself, I am a doctor, I am the father of four uh, who are in the various uh, uh, types of schools, uh, primaries, from primary schools to high school, introduces the topic. We're going to talk about financing to devote to uh, families in need. This is a tough discussion. Families choose our school because they would like to have quality education for their children and we would like, we want to train children and students who are ready to face the challenges of the world. We have an exclusive method and an inclusive proposal for everybody. Julio is the former president of the school, he's a geologist, now his sons, his children are at university. And he remembers that this aid in the past has been the entry gate for many families who cannot afford to pay the school fees and who, however, wanted more than anything else to offer their children a possibility. So how much should we devote to this topic? There are lots of requests and money is never enough. Stefano is the father of three and he works for a, a 
consultancy company. He's often uh, away for work, and in order not to, in order to be present at this meeting, he's connected from Skype, and he remembers. He reminds us all that we should uh, uh, actually always respect the budget limitations. So actually, we uh, then make a decision after discussing and move on to the next topic on the agenda, which is WhatsApp. That's particularly uh, often used among mothers who actually uh, sometimes devote uh, too much time on this WhatsApp. Uh, we should actually think about the tools currently used. Actually, there are important topics to discuss. For example, the destination of the school uh, trip. I mean, all of these uh, decisions can be uh, enhanced or diminished in value by these uh, virtual tools, which are useful to, uh, in a way, uh, take into account. And then we move on up to the last point on the agenda. And then at the given point, actually, the alarm bell of the school rings. Uh, Giovanni looks at the watch and, uh, as always, tells actually this tonight as well. We went uh, well beyond midnight, uh, so we hurry up dividing the last uh, parts. Uh, we divide the tasks for the next time. We actually uh, remind ourselves that we we should use driver to share information. Then we come back home, and it's about one in the night. So, Mr. Minister, I wanted to tell you how a typical day of work works to highlight that ex uh, uh, with the exception of the director there are nine volunteers who carry out this task uh, on a voluntary basis and our only wish is to educate as best as possible our children and the children of the others and also to highlight that institutions so actually you and your ministry are asked this reality the non-state schools to be supported so training children capable of meeting today's challenges, the working challenges, is an asset, not only for the families entrusting them to us, but for the whole of society. So we are no longer asking you for more subsidies, but rather for more subsidiarity. In other words, we would like to have the close supervision of the institutions who actually look at this part of society, non-state schools, and encourage them and support them because they recognize the value that they can bring to the common good. So I have two questions to you. One is a general question, and the other one is a more technical one. First question, what prospects can we think about for non-state schools in the national education uh, system? And then the second technical school, should non-state school use enabled? So they, they, are, they are to use non-enabled uh, uh, qualified teachers, but there are no pathways for them to teach in these schools. And this creates a lot of confusion. So we would like to ask you when the educational pathways for young graduates to acquire the certification which makes them in line to teach in non-state schools. Well, this is a very tricky question. For a couple of years, I also had the task of managing all non-state schools of Lombardy. So I am well aware of the topics that you submitted to me with your questions. Well, let's talk about prospects first. Non-state schools are an integral part of the national education system, and nothing has to be questioned on this. They are, there is a law regulating their functioning. It's Law 62 of the year 2000, which foresees a whole series of uh, um, obligations which well regulates the characteristics of these schools, their functioning. And it foresees also a series of recommendations from an organizational and, organ and, and, and uh, normative uh, point of view for non-state schools to uh, be working. And one of these characteristics is to have uh, teachers uh, who are, so to say, enabled, 
who have been declared qualified to teach. Uh, this has never posed a problem in latest years because the uh, lists, uh, official lists of uh, teachers uh, would actually also include this kind of uh, uh, teachers. Then a new way of recruiting teachers was introduced. Uh, to tell you the truth, I didn't like it very much because it conditioned uh, the life of lots of people, forcing teachers to move away from their uh, area uh, of origin uh, to far away, distant areas. Uh, and this poses a lot of problems to them. Uh, and the lists were gradually uh, used up, so to say. So now non-state schools uh, actually lack students because these, uh, not students, I'm sorry, uh, teachers, because these teachers are now hired by state schools. That's an issue. And similarly to the, uh, to other important issues, uh, that, that's a problem that we have uh, to, uh, to have to, we have to address. Clearly, uh, non-state schools, in order to be such, will have to reach the standards of state schools from this point of view. And we will work soon on that. We will set ourselves uh, to work on this. This is a topic that will certainly have to be managed and regulated soon to give certainty to workers, to managers, to those who work as volunteers and also in the state. Actually, also in the state system, those who are part of a school committee is a volunteer. That's the work of uh, also of uh, um, parents uh, who participate in these meetings. This is something that, of course, has to be praised, uh, but uh, it happens in the state as well. But I am sure of the fact, I am convinced of the fact that non-state schools are an asset and we will try and enhance them. Paolo. Buonasera. So good afternoon. My name is Paolo Maino. I am a principal, the principal of a school in Busto Arsizio, uh, near Milan. I would like to thank you for what you said before, because you pointed out uh, that there is a whole administrative machine before the start of a school year. Probably many people are not aware of that. They work in the back office. Uh, we are talking about administrative assistants and also uh, janitors, uh, because in September, we have janitors coming to me and they're proud and actually they show me, please and come and see how clean the corridor is. Well, often I start my first meeting of teachers in September by describing this, by telling this. And I would like to invite and involve teachers in our common objective. We are an educating community and all adults are part of this educating community, all adults who are working in a school collaborating in the education. You can do that also as a janitor by keeping a classroom clean or by informing the principal that, for example, children behaved not that well. So thank you for pointing that out because actually sometimes uh, all these uh, people working behind the lines are not normally sent. I started working as a principal in June 2014 after 15 years uh, teaching between state schools and non-state schools. I started working uh, in this role because I was um, willing to animate my uh, teacher colleagues in their uh, education uh, 
task for youngsters, for young generations. Young generations today live in a context in which it is very, very difficult between uh, knowing how to choose and knowing how to evaluate. The context surrounding them can easily, is easily, uh, can easily lead our students uh, uh, prey of fake news. Uh, So the experience of the four years I've had uh, has been really very ex interesting. As a school, we have tried uh, to, in a way, do a lot of projects by looking at needs. Uh, and we've also looked at individual criticalities, the criticalities of individual students who require networking. Uh, so for example, the class uh, committee or local players who can uh, be education active in the field of education or not active in that field in order to meet their needs the needs of individuals and then besides that besides the time devoted to these tasks very often time and energy especially the time and energy of principals uh, uh, have to come to terms with a lot of requests, requests on the part of the regional school office, uh, on the part of the ministry, and so on. Let me give you a, an example. In order to activate a 30-hour course of uh, um, financed by the European Social Fund, you need to give parents 11 pages they, they have to be filled in they have to be returned to the secretariat they have to be scanned turned into a PDF file loaded into a system and then you have to fill in a number of pop-up windows by indicating the same data so that process is over then you start the you activate the module and then you discover that you had to upload yet another document that was not stated at the beginning so actually, there is no wise use of time in this respect, especially because uh, there, are this, there are poor resources. Last summer, for example, I myself did this work of scanning documents. But there's a word I would like to point out, which is the word autonomy. In order for autonomy to be fulfilled, before reasoning on what to do, which is the normos, the Greek normos, so the, the law, we need to identify and recognize who does things, so the autos, so the person who thinks, who plans, acts, and judges, and evaluates, and who defines his, uh, uh, his actions in collaboration with his supervisors, with the ministry, uh, in uh, compliance with national and regional laws. So the regulation on autonomy that dates back on 1999 had a, a group of people at the core of its work, a group of people and subjects, um, that is to say the parents, the families, coordinated by the principal in this, in the, in the design and implementation of the curriculum. Over the last 20 years, however, school autonomy has been the subject of a, uh, a top-down uh, process, so some kind of an imposition from the center to the periphery without the possibility for the subjects of the school community to make their own decisions. At the same time, and along with this process, the role of the principal, who is the person in charge of the implementation of the school guidance and who has become the full responsible of the uh, organization, autonomous organization of the school, has become more and more bureaucratic. In other words, we are flooded by lots of bureaucratic uh, burdens and lots of red tape. There was a law that uh, recent law that uh, basically implied the new definition of uh, uh, subjects involved, but that was not uh, complied. So my, my, my question is the following. What uh, does the ministry intend to do 
in order to start a real and process a real process of implementation of the autonomy of the education community indicated by the uh, regulation on autonomy thank you very much actually we have to go back uh, uh, to lots of past laws, the Bassanini law, in order to understand the spirit of the word autonomy in these cases. Uh, autonomy doesn't mean self-determination. Autonomy means that we have to have a subject who is capable of negotiating in the territory. This is what autonomy uh, should be about. Uh, and actually, we have to be uh, frank. Uh, m much has been made, much progress has been made. There was a regulation in 1999. And that regulation was also quite forward looking, so still very topical. But clearly, the Consolidation Act must be, should and must be. Uh, revised. Our Consolidation Act is even older, and within that Consolidation Act, we should also review the composition and the management of the committees and boards inside it. But allow me to say it, uh, I believe that uh, autonomy should be based on the principle of identity. School, the school has to be at the core of the so to say, creation and formation of the identity of the individual. And autonomy can favor this. It provides, uh, it can provide sense of belonging. It can, uh, in a way, assume many different views towards the future. And it can uh, lay the foundations for synergies with uh, uh, the territory and the players who, in a way, uh, work and live in the school. The principal has, uh, to a certain extent, uh, become uh, a bureaucrat, I have to admit. This is uh, required by a law of the regulation. But the principal has this task as well, the task of becoming the element, the element that is capable of making a synthesis between uh, uh, the needs of a territory and the potential of a territory. And the work of many principles from this point of view has uh, been seen. This is, of course, no longer enough. Maybe uh, school principals need someone uh, supporting them. Sometimes they are leading persons. So they need offices. They need administrative offices supporting them. They need uh, the bodies and the institutions supporting them. And they also need uh, to, in a way, convey their own vision uh, when drafting, when setting up the school offer, the education offer. These are topics uh, which uh, will uh, certainly have to be revised uh, and reviewed. Uh, uh, national operational plans foresee really very interesting, uh, uh, sometimes absurd, I have to say, operational procedures. But if you had the task of auditors, I mean, their task is even worse because they are called to revise, uh, they're called three years later to revise uh, documents and accounts of three years earlier. But I believe that the, uh, when it comes to autonomy, principles play a fundamental role. And I would really uh, like uh, you to, to consider your role as principles uh, as uh, uh, a role of responsibility, of direct responsibility on everybody. And there's one thing that we need to do in the future, which is that of controlling uh, objectives. Objectives have to be uh, transparent, shared at the beginning, and they will have to be evaluated. This is probably what schools are missing today. Uh, competencies are sometimes uh, uh, confused with objectives. And actually, a, a review has to, to start from the central administration 
and that in order to give uh, uh, schools a good starting point to then revise and maintain autonomy and actually uh, have it be uh, in line with the uh, with current times but autonomy is a value that needs to be preserved also constitutionally it is well present in our constitution thank you very much il titolo the title of this uh, meeting was the following question does education make people happy well after uh, this meeting we can say that learning makes people happy if it uh, is a form of education if it brings people in contact with reality the reality and its meaning as uh, father Giussani said in the different fields in the different aspects that are uh, um, dealt with in classroom in the classroom this education can help everyone to find their identity because it encourages self-consciousness, self-awareness. And so this education helps the discovery of the self, of what moves our hearts. And this can happen only through a dialogue, a communication between students and teachers, a free dialogue between the reason of the teacher and the reason of the student. And a dialogue, and I quote the words of the Pope during the uh, day of uh, education in school in a, an educational uh, community in a village, in a, an educating community that could give everyone the opportunity to discover oneself, both for teachers and for students. So therefore, we uh, always want to have this interaction with uh, the ministers of education. And what we uh, always ask to our uh, decision makers is that in the different aspects that the minister has dealt with, autonomy, eventually the reform of uh, high school graduation exams and so on, well, that the central aspect of teaching has to be enhanced. That is to say, this educational dialogue in an educating community between the self Conscience, consciousness of the teacher and that of the student. We, as teachers, will go on creating, we'll go on loving this job, which is the most beautiful job in the world, because by educating and teaching, we discover the truth about ourselves and the truth as the meaning of the things we explain to our students and as the ultimate value of the person or and the persons we have in front of us in a classroom. Thank you, and I wish you all a very nice evening. Thank you. Thank you for your